So this morning, I, I, today's one of those days, I really do encourage you to pick up your pew Bible and follow along, because I'm going to be reading off these names, but as I share today, I'm going to be pinpointing some of what we can not only hear, but see. And then, of course, there's a punchline that it's worth seeing as well as hearing. I'm going to be doing Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, and for now up and through verse uh, 17. Listen now to the Word of God. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nashon. And Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathur the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations of Abraham to David are 14 generations and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the opportunity to gather around your word. We need your help. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, a rock and redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Family tree. It's all about genealogy, right? We're talking about our heritage here at the church and the church family and the history. Family tree. I suspect some of you have, have done some research into your family tree. We may know something about our grandparents. What about our great-grandparents and our great-great-grandparents? I mean, some people take quite an interest in family history, dig into it. Daughters of the American Revolution, right? Sons of the American Revolution. People can trace their you know, exponentially great-grandparents back to serving in the American Revolution. That's part of the family tree. When I lived in South Carolina, it was uh, all about sons and daughters of the Confederacy. You know, a lot of those folks had, had uh, exponentially great grandparents served in the Civil War on this side of the Confederacy. And uh, a lot of those folks, when I'd talk to them about that, they'd say, it's my heritage. It's my heritage, right? Heritage, family history, right? So I got into this a little bit. Um, I, I actually, a few years ago, I, I dug into some family history. I traced 
the lineage, the family line from my grandmother's mother, my dad's mother's mother, and I kind of went out and figured out using Ancestry.com when it was free. And I just, I, I hit a gold mine. I mean, I was finding all kinds of great stuff about family, you know, and, and I, that line of the family, by and large, started coming over here from Europe on the Great Plymouth migration, coming over on ships. Um, and, and some of the points of interest in my family tree I found, I did have uh, four exponentially great grandfathers who served in the American Revolution. One was killed at Saratoga. One fought in the Battle of Bunker, Bunker Hill. One kid was a drummer, you know, going up Bunker Hill. I think he lived. Um, but, but then, that was interesting. But another interesting discovery I made, one of my great-great-great-grandparents was a founding charter member of the English colony on Nantucket. I mean, they were working with, I mean, I, I've seen the signature from one of the ancient documents. But that wasn't the most interesting discovery I made. The most interesting discovery I made, an exponentially great grandmother was put in jail in Worcester, Massachusetts when they were having witch trials up in Salem and hanging people in Salem. And then they were looking to start hanging people outside of Salem. Turns out that my exponentially great grandmother was married but she had a reputation for being a trollop in the local town. Trollop as in loose, more, you know, a trollop, a gutter snipe, what have you. Phoebe Tyler Wallingford said stuff like that. She was a gutter snipe. And so she was put in jail, uh, you know, being accused of being a witch. I mean, that's fascinating to me. That's my family tree. You know, you've got an interesting family here and the, the church family going back to your own family tree. Some of you may not even care about your own family tree. I don't care. I don't care. Well, someone cares about a family tree because it's right here, right out of the gate in the Gospel of Matthew. I don't know when the last time was you heard a message where the guy up front read every name in the list and I'm butchered, you know, a number of pronunciations, I'm sure. But the point is, Matthew opens his gospel by declaring that Jesus is the Messiah and here are his credentials. Here is his pedigree. It's a family tree. It starts with, you know, the first Jew, Abraham, and goes all the way up through, through Joseph, the father of Jesus. So he, he starts this. Now, Matthew's gospel was written for Jews. There's so many quotes in the context of the gospel that are Hebrew scriptures quoted to show the Jews who are hearing this, who Matthew wants to become Christians, Jews for Jesus, if you will. And so Jews back in that day, I guess today to some extent, whatever, they were interested in genealogy, in who your mama was, and who your daddy was. They wanted to know all these things. And to make sure that the Messiah has got... Serious blood. And so this, this genealogy here, this family tree is divided into three parts. And I'm going to point a few things out in each of the three parts. I'm not going to read it again. But in the first part, the first third, you know, it's 14 generations. It starts with Abraham and the first part ends with King David. And Abraham is the father of all Jews. Certainly biologically, certainly by blood. He was the first Jew. God picked Abraham and his wife Sarah, who were senior citizens, and, and called them out of a pagan culture and said, I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people, you're going to have many you know, descendants, and I'm going to give your descendants real estate. That's what he promised Abraham. And of course, Abraham and Sarah, like I said, senior citizens. So how's that going to happen? When, when Sarah you know, is in her 70s, how's she going to have a baby? Well, it was a miracle. 
the nation of Israel started supernaturally, at least insofar as a conception. The, the, first, the, the second generation of Jew was a supernatural. I mean, granted, you know, Abram and, and Sarah got together, but I mean, they were senior citizens. But she had a baby. And that baby was Isaac. So the nation of Israel is off and running. Remember, Isaac is the one where, you know, after all this time and all this miracle, then God said, okay, there's your child. Go sacrifice him, Abraham. You know, and that was a big piece of drama in the story of God and his people. But, of course, uh, you know, Isaac dodges the bullet and he lives. And the next generation is Jacob. And Jacob is a twin. Remember the story, Jacob and Esau and that whole drama, and I mean, you know, the, the original uh, patriarchs, fathers of the nation of Israel, that's what the book of Genesis is about. It's not just about creation and the flood. It's about the first Jews, the first generations. So then in that first section, it goes on and on. There's plenty of names. But then it comes down, I think, to a very interesting name, Ruth. Did you hear that when I read it? Ruth, did you see it? She's in the, the, the genealogy, the family tree. A woman's name mentioned Ruth. Well, it turns out Ruth is interesting and important. She's in the family tree, but she's distinguished because she's not a Jew. She didn't particularly have, so far as we know, a whole lot of Jewish blood in her. She was a Moabitess. A Moabitess. Sounds kind of like a bug, a Moabitess. You know, I was a Moabitess. She was from the nation of, Is of uh, Moab. It was an enemy nation to the people of Israel. In the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah is a woman who was from the nation of Israel. Or, I mean, the nation of Moab, an enemy nation to Israel. So, I mean, what's, that, that's pretty impressive and, and pretty, you know, awesome of God. And what an interesting way that God works. But, of course, she marries a guy named Boaz. I mean, that sounds kind of like a clown, Boaz. But Boaz was, a, you know, a good, faithful Jew. And, and uh, they end up being the grandparents of, you know, David. I said the grandparents are great grandparents. But David is where the section ends. David, King David. It's important that the Messiah come from the line of David. That's what all the Hebrew scriptures have been saying. That the Messiah is going to come from David. Born in the city of David. The new David. The throne of David lasts forever. The Messiah, right? The king of the kingdom of God. The new David. Well, David was a man after God's own heart. We talked about David dancing in his underwear before the ark today in Sunday school class. The plot thickens. He loved the Lord. You know, he was the public enemy number one to the enemies of the nation of Israel. So David was where, you know, that's where the bloodline of, of uh, this genealogy is taking us. Next section. Um, it goes, well, and, and, and it goes from King David through the last king that sat on the throne there in Jerusalem. It's all basically kings. Section 2 is all basically kings. So starting with David, of course, the next king in the family tree is Solomon. There's plenty we could say about Solomon. You know the basics, right? Rich, wise, wrote Proverbs, Solomon. He loved nature, right? He loved women. 700 wives, 300 concubines, Solomon. He's in the family tree. Solomon. He short circuits at the end of his reign. And that carries on to his son. You saw Rehoboam. Most of these kings in this list, in the genealogy of Jesus, most of these kings, bad kings, terrible kings. Now there were some good kings. Hezekiah was a good king. Josiah was a good king. You can read about them. In fact, Hezekiah was a great king. Hezekiah had a huge reform in Israel and in, in uh, Jerusalem. 
And uh, he got rid of all the high places, all the idols, and he got the, pr the priests all back in line. Hezekiah did a good job, but the Assyrians were coming to get Jerusalem, get Hezekiah, get everybody. The Assyrians, they locked the gates, the walls of Jerusalem were shut, and this enemy was camped outside. So what did good King Hezekiah do? He turned to God and he said, help. What did God do? He helped. <laughs> he gave a plague to the people in a, a Syrian uh, army there. And either the, the Syrian army died or they left. So Hezekiah was a good king. His son was a nut. His son put the, the, you know, the idols back up in the temple. His son was so bad. Manasseh, his son was like one of the worst kings in Israel. Great king Hezekiah followed by loser king Manasseh who was um, invoking mediums and spiritists and divination. Setting up altars in the temples of God. Manasseh even had one of his own sons, as it says in the Bible, walk through the fire. He sacrificed his son. I mean, terrible king. And then, and then the kings, it leads up in that second section to the last king, which uh, was listed as Jaconia, uh, Jaconiah, who gets taken into exile. Because the Babylonians finally come and they take Israel, the kings, what have you, into exile. And they're outside of Israel for 70 years, outside the promised land 70 years. That's what the last little passage is about in the list. And most of the names in the list, I mean, you, you probably wouldn't recognize. I, don't rec I recognize Joseph at the end. But there's one name in there that's worth just mentioning here. We're almost done with this survey. But one name... Did you happen to see or hear when I said Zerubbabel? Hear that, Zerubbabel? That sounds like a game, right? So well, let's play Zerubbabel. Let's play Zerubbabel, you know, with the dice and this, that. Zerubbabel. What is Zerubbabel? Who was that? Well, Zerubbabel was a big wig, a very important figure when Israel comes back from exile, comes back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls, to rebuild the temple, and it's Zerubbabel who's like a, a, an authority figure, a leader who's in charge. Zerubbabel oversaw the building, or at least the start of the building, of the temple. The temple. Much smaller than the one that was built by Solomon, but it was still in the same spot, much smaller space. So when Jesus comes to town 500 plus years later, that foundation was laid by Zerubbabel. And then all these other names. And it leads up to Joseph. Leads up to Joseph, the father of Jesus. Isn't that cool? There's the genealogy. That's how Matthew starts his gospel. There's the pedigree right there. And we're all thinking, whatever. I'm thinking that. Like, whatever. So what does it matter? These people, okay, Abraham, okay. It's just a bunch of, whatever. These are famous people. These are Bible, you know, Sunday school uh, topics and such. Right? Where, where do I fit in? What's the takeaway for me? Don't I get something out of this? What does God have for us in this family tree? This genealogy leading from Abraham to Joseph? Look at the next verse. Look at it, or if you're not looking at it, listen to it. After everything I read, still, chapter 1, verse 18 of Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Live together means, the original word is knew her. Joseph wasn't intimate with Mary. That's what that verse is telling us. After this big genealogy leading all the way up to Joseph in the bloodline, then the gospel writer Matthew says, oh yeah, and by the way, there's not a drop of Joseph's blood in Jesus who's the Messiah. How do you like that, Jews, listening to the story? I mean, it is off the charts. It's revolutionary. 
This is a big deal. Because then when we go on and we read, we discover Mary was a virgin in accord with the Hebrew scriptures, which Matthew quotes. She was a virgin. Joseph did not know her, was not intimate with her. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, she conceived. She conceived in a miracle conception by the power of the Holy Spirit. That even tops the supernatural conception of way back with Abraham and Sarai. They were senior citizens, but it took two for them to tango in this. This is the Holy Spirit and Mary. This is a miracle of miracles, much bigger. Nation of Israel starts with a miracle conception. Kingdom of God, the birth of the king, starts with an even bigger miracle, a Virgin conceives by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, what's the value of this genealogy? What's the point of this genealogy? Going through the bloodline of Joseph. How does Joseph respond to all this? When he finds out that Mary's pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit, what's his response? Does he divorce her? Does he leave her? Does he leave this boy, Jesus, once he's born, high and dry? Ladies and gentlemen, Joseph becomes the adoptive father of Jesus. Right? He's not the biological, earthly father of Jesus. He's the adoptive father of Jesus. Jesus works with his dad, right? You know, he's a carpenter. People know Jesus is the son of Joseph. There's some murmurings about, well, what's up with Mary? But you see, in the Jewish culture, they didn't have like what we now have in our culture where adoption is, you know, a, a wonderful opportunity for those who can't have children that want to have a child. It's a lovely thing. But back then in the Jewish culture, that's not typically what you did. And yet Joseph does this thing. He becomes the adoptive father of Jesus. That's where we come in. That's where we get our practical takeaway. Did you see your bulletin? You see what's written in your bulletin there? At the top? See that verse? You can look at that. And Paul's the one that does it. Paul's the one that gives us a smoking gun for our takeaway today. Right? What does he say? I'm going to expand on what Paul wrote there. And I'm going to give you the verses leading up to that verse that you have in front of you. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3 verse 26. You are all sons of God, as in sons and daughters of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, nor male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise. Abraham's offspring, Christians, Gentiles, You might not have a Jewish drop of blood in you. I don't know. So far, I haven't discovered in my Ancestry.com a drop of Jew. But I may. But even if not, as Christians, we're a part of a spiritual kingdom. God is spirit. God is with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. These people in this list are a part of our heritage, ladies and gentlemen. Our heritage. Whether we actually, uh, all the saints, Old Testament saints, folks, Old Testament Hebrew scripture saints, they're a part of our family tree, our heritage, right? Our spiritual heritage. Do we care? Do we take an interest? Do we even know who Boaz is? (laughs) You know, I mean... (laughs) Take a look at who Boaz is. Read the book of Ruth. I guarantee you, at the very least, what the Lord would do, a heritage. You know, here we are, we're celebrating. This is really cool. Just don't get grape juice on this thing. 
you know, I mean, it, it, there's so much to celebrate in our church history in 200 years. Why not go back 4,000 years? Because when we look at Ruth, when we look at Abraham, when we look at Shealtiel, when we look at Zerubbabel, they're a part of our spiritual heritage. But what's amazing is those people are interacting with God, the power of God, the presence of God, the story of God. So when we invest in looking up those people and studying those people as we would Michener and Shakespeare and all these other wonderful things that we spend our time reading and things watching on TV, if we invested in these people, not only could we learn, gosh, it's interesting who these people are, but we see how God operates with these people, and maybe we get a takeaway for us in our faith. Maybe we learn something by studying King David. And I definitely commend to you uh, all of Scripture, but I think, I mean, when Jesus quoted Scripture, what Scripture was he quoting? I mean, it's the Hebrew Scripture. It's the Old Testament. We call it the Old Testament. It's the Hebrew Scriptures. And I dare say, and I want to really encourage all of us, you, me, let's dig in. The Lord would have us do it. He said, you can't live, you know, apart from the word of God. By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's our daily bread. And the word of God that he was talking about at that point, Jesus was talking about the Hebrew scriptures. Family tree, folks. Maybe that's where we start. Do we even care? Do we care? I don't care. You know, I don't care. Old Testament. God's so mean in the Old Testament anyway. He's just mean. Why do I care? I don't care. It's too many words. It's too many. It's all lists. We've got all kinds of reasons why we don't do it. That's business between you and me and the Lord. That's his word. These are our people. These are our people. You know, and, and I dare say, we'd say dig in. So what happened to the woman who was in jail? Right? The woman in jail in Worcester. The woman on trial for witchcraft. What happened to her? Well, I know. What didn't happen to her? So as it turns out, in that neck of the woods, you know, the outbreak was in Salem, right? In 1691, 92. They, would kill, they killed 20-some-odd people. The last few they killed were people that said, I didn't do it. I don't care. Kill me. I didn't do it. I'm not a witch. And they start hanging them. And, I mean, they were up into the 20s, you know, killing these people in Salem. And here's this woman, you know, shaking in her boots in jail. In Worcester. Well, the people in Boston who were the magistrates who were in charge, they were taking a look and, and at the lay of the land and saying, What are you crazy people doing up in Salem? There aren't that many witches up there. You people are crazy. You need to stop it. You need to quit getting people or we're going to get you. And so they stopped killing the people up in Salem with a few of them saying, I didn't do it. And the woman who was in jail in Worcester, she got off the hook. They let her out of jail. She was free to go about her trollopy ways, I'm sure. Right? Family tree. This is the family tree. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you. Most of all, for you. We need your help. Just help us to take an interest. In our heritage, our spiritual heritage, the saints, the stories surrounding the saints, where you interacted with these people, you loved them all, but you made a difference in their lives, for better or worse, for them. Help us to learn from that, have an interest in that, pique our interest, in the same way that we would take an interest in sports and hobbies and however we spend our time. Give us that burning inside of us to want to really check out our heritage and these people in your word which is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword and pierces deep it's in jesus name we pray amen